you do say that there's some, there should be a limit to religious freedom. I think there should be a limit to all sorts of things, uh, religious freedom, political freedom, all the rest of it, in the same way that there should be limits of common sense to, to uh, you know, our methods of, of selling food that's bad lay for what you. you mean, lay out what you mean in relation to religion. What I mean in relation to religion is that the separation of church and state has to be maintained by the law, by public opinion. There, there are limits to what you can do in policy areas based on what you believe. Take, for instance, I think a good example is this whole fight against gay rights and gay marriage. Mm -hmm. the, there ought to be a limit to somebody like James Dobson being able to pull the trigger on the Republican Party to suddenly make this an issue because it works for fundraising. And the limit is that you can't have policy made on the basis of a, of, a, of a, a theocracy mm -hmm. waiting in the wings, which is what this whole dominion theory that I talk about in my book is about. So those 115 million, I think, that focus on the family spent on Maine's effort to overturn marriage equality? Yeah, should or just the be Mormon stopped. church, or the Roman Catholics, or anybody else. I don't think it should necessarily be illegal in the sense that you can't stop people from saying something. But it has to be put out into the open mm -hmm. that we're talking about a form of religious discrimination against people here and that this doesn't belong in American politics. Let's go back to the other part of your book, which I really appreciated. Um, well, first, let's start with the comment that you make that if you had just found art early on or stuck with painting, right. you might have been saved all of this. Yes, I would have been saved everything if I had been less greedy and less ambitious as a 18, 19, 20 year old to, to you know, get into the big time access to power, that kind of seduction. I would not have become my dad's sidekick for eight or nine years, and I would have stuck with what I really wanted to do earlier, which was to paint. I was painting paintings that were going into galleries and pretty precocious for the, at a young age and stupidly gave this up. But one of the reasons I got out of the whole religious right was that the kind of people the religious right hated, you know, artists, gay people, movie directors like Vittoria De Sica or Fellini, these were the people I liked. Mm. So to be perfectly frank about it, it, it had a lot less to do with theology than simple taste. Mm. Uh, you, know, you, you know, if you're hanging around with people you share nothing with, except some, you know, vague political commitment or you think Jesus saves, at a certain point it's, you just can't hack it anymore. I mean, who, 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 who wants to be standing in this line? Two lines are forming. One is to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The other is to the Crystal Cathedral. Where would you rather be? <laughs> you write about the religious right being fueled in part by people's personal crises, personal Very drama. So. Um, talk about that a little bit and the way in which maybe that culture of personal crisis plays out in a situation of depression economics. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, uh, Max Blumenthal touches on this in his book, um, Republican Gomorrah, and I go into it in my book again from an inside perspective, and that is that, you know, you have to look at this. We pitched the pro-life movement, the anti-abortion movement, on the basis of crisis. It will lead to Armageddon. It's going to lead to infanticide, euthanasia, death panels. You know, Palin borrowed that from the rhetoric we developed in the 70s, by the way. Um, People like Dobson pitch it on family breakdown. Unless you believe in Jesus and unless you discipline my way, which includes, you know, beating your children, literally, until they fall into your arms, um, you know, you're going to lose your family. They're going to become whatever, you know, hippies or homosexuals or vote Democrat or, or, you know, whatever. Crisis is what fuels the movement because the movement turns on this born again experience. You were lost. You say the magic words. Now you're saved. You were voting Democrat. You see the light. Now you wrote Republican and solve all your problems. So that, you know, when you look at the, the lunatic fringe of this fringe and they're showing up at meetings carrying loaded assault weapons, wearing signs saying that the, the tree of liberty has to be watered by the yeah. blood of tyrants, I see a direct line back into some of those things we're doing. And I talk about in the book, for instance, the fact that these, these, this, this worship of Armageddon or this idea of dominion over the country and bringing it back to Jesus, for a lot of people, can be interpreted in a way that, that leads, I think, to violence and, and will and has in the past and will again. So if the answer is not to replace one type of dogmatic certainty, here right. is the way, with another kind of dogmatic certainty, that's definitely not the way, this right. is the way, what is the answer? You talk about an apophatic tradition? Apophatic theology, yeah, the sort of the theology of not knowing, which might be put a different way, the theology of, of of humility. I mean, look, if, if Hitchens and Dawkins and I sat down for a discussion, we'd all argue our points, but, it, but I would hope that early in that debate, I would say to them, look, I could be completely wrong. Who knows what they're talking about? We're a young, evolving species. We're a, we're a geological eye blink away from single-celled amoeba-like creatures. 
here we're all sitting around this table holding forth on these big questions using metaphors, which is all speech is. Come on, guys, none of us have access to the truth. Let's just all back off here. So in the second half of the book, what I do is rather than make an argument, I talk about my granddaughter and the fact that I have a relationship with her that I find points to a sense of meaning and mm -hmm. purpose. Call it God if you want, call it something else if you want. I talk about a teacher I had in a, in a school called Great Walstead, south of London, when I was a kid who opened all the doors for me. Uh, taught me to read because I was dyslexic, helped me out. And, and, and these are the areas where we can get past all the politics of religion and just say, look, it isn't a question of who's saved and who's lost. You know, nobody's good, nobody's going to hell, nobody's utterly damned. It's a question of the teacher you had, the child you love, the lover that you've got, the wife or the husband. Let's get to the human discussion. Salvation is a journey, you say. Salvation is and, a journey. And, and, and not knowing is to be celebrated. Your Christianity sounds a lot like Buddhism to me. Well, my Christianity is a Christianity that I think is tempered by the example set by Christ, where he breaks the Old Testament law and he says, no, don't throw stones at this woman because she broke the law. Who, who amongst you is innocent? Or it's like saying, who amongst you thinks you're evolved enough to draw these big conclusions about the cosmos? Uh, and, and basically, to me, that's the example that's set by, by all real moral teaching, whether it comes from atheists or agnostics or Christians or Buddhists. That's where the, we find some enlightenment. That's where we find some hope. And it isn't in these declarative absolute statements about who's lost, who's saved, who's in, who's out. You know, you don't mock people who believe in God as having, quote, imaginary friends. Give me a break. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. is not to be mocked for his imaginary friend that led to him spearheading the civil rights movement. What kind of a job do you think Barack Obama is doing and what job are leaders to do in this situation where on the one hand you want them to say, look, let's not fight over the stupid mm -hmm. stuff that we don't know. But on the other hand, you are saying, let's call some behavior out of line. Yeah, and I think those two things go in ha hand in hand. And you asked me my view on what Barack Obama is doing. I'm an enormous fan of Barack Obama. I think this is probably the greatest uh, political leader of my lifetime maybe one of the two or three presidents who will shape up as the greatest presidents of this country. I, I, I have a big quibble with people on the left who are impatient with him. And of, and of course, you know, an immense disagreement with people on the right who are telling all these horrible lies about him. And I, I think he's tremendous. And I think one of the areas he's showing real leadership is in exactly this. Look, the guy's a Christian. He talks about going to church. He had a, a, a religious salvation experience. He's not trying to ram it down anybody's throat. He's not judging people as lost who don't go along with it. This isn't George W. Bush, you know, the evangelical president. Yet he clearly has faith which guides him. And, and I think he sets a great example in terms of, of what real faith in politics are and how they mix. So what does his faith lead him to do? You know, we, conservative faith in this country has gotten to a point where it, it wants legalized torture but it doesn't want health care for everybody. Well, he's reversing this. And this is why the world looks at him and says, at last, America has a leader worthy of this country. But how do you do that and stop the Palinites who you say present a looming threat of real violence? I think when someone tells a barefaced lie, you call it a lie. You don't do what the mainstream media does and dance around this thing and say, oh, well, we'll get both points of view. There are no points of view on a lie for instance, saying he palled around with terrorists or a lie, for instance, saying that he's not an American citizen or a lie, saying there'll be death panels if we have a single payer system of health care or even revise our health care system as it is. This is this. We need to be tough on the lies. And when it comes to the big questions, be tolerant of other people and say, hey, I could be wrong. Frank Schaefer, the new book is Patience with God, Faith for People Who Don't Like Religion or Atheism. Check it out. The information's at our website, grittv.org. Thanks for being with us, Frank. It's my pleasure. Thanks a lot.